Next speaker is Professor Olna. She is with us uh, online. Uh, let me just briefly introduce her. Professor Olna is a cognitive scientist and calls herself a neuroscientist and a media psychologist. She uh, worked in Osnabrück in Canada, in the Netherlands, in London, and uh, since 2019, she's been a professor for media psychology at the um, University for um, Communication and Media and uh, Management in Cologne. Ms. Ona says that it is necessary to have a constructive form of journalism. It is easily imaginable, but unfortunately not that easy to find. That would be a form of journalism that does not only point to problems, but uh, you know, if possible, also presents some possible approaches towards a solution. Her mission is you know, she says that the media do too much negative reporting and we have a distorted and negative image of the world. And she wrote a book about this phenomenon and the title is Let's Stop the Daily Destruction of Our World, How We Defend Ourselves Against the Digital Rubbish in Our Brains. We're looking forward to your presentation, Professor Honor, and I think it's working out. I can see you. Welcome here in the virtual space. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I hope that everyone over there can actually hear me well. Perhaps you can just uh, give me a brief feedback uh, from the technicians. I mean, we tested everything up front, but uh, I just hope that it's working. Yes? Okay, great. So let me just uh, start this uh, with uh, this uh, presentation here on screen. I hope that you can now all see my presentation as well as my face here on screen. I have got a number of slides here. And I would like to now try to uh, offer you my program, if you will. And towards the end, I think we will have time for questions. And if you've got a very pressing question, we can also answer that in between. The title is based on today's motto, between fear or anxiety and optimism, and how we can uh, you know, confront the flood of information with our Stone Age brain. And as you heard from my introduction, I am from an entirely different uh, discipline, from the neurosciences. And for almost 10 years, I looked at how our brain is actually processing information and uh, why we all have such different perceptions of the world, although we have a rather similar brain that we're equipped with. But there are major differences. And we know that, especially, you know, when uh, after a political discussion, uh, you come to different opinions, but also in terms of the perception of uh, individual words or colors, there are major differences. And that was interesting to me, and uh, I then started working on the, the subject matter of uh, the media, and I founded Perspective Daily. We had, as I mission constructive journalism, and I almost thought that, uh, you know, it was planned that way that Professor Buda ended his presentation with a constructive proposal. You know, it was a very nice uh, segue for me because uh, the subject of hope and confidence also plays a major role for my work. So I am managed to get my, find my way back into teaching and doing research and I'm now working at the University in Cologne and then this happened. And of course, we've all seen this time and time again, and we know what it's done to us over the past uh, month. And we also know that it actually upended the lives of many, many people, and it uh, definitely affects all of us. And you know, from the psychological point of view, I call this a global trauma that is uh, actually keeping us busy, and that's also making sure that all the different areas of our lives, you know, be it the private lives, professional lives, but also our social lives are being changed significantly and uh, but if I were now present there you know as an analog person I'd be there with a flip chart or a whiteboard then I would actually do a little knowledge quiz with everyone who's there in order to find out how representative the visitors in the room would be for Germany as a whole but now I just present you the findings in a briefer version I have three small questions on the overall state of the world so if you're there or if you're watching us online you can please feel free to answer the following three questions. And I'm also, of course, going to present the correct answers to you. And I'm also going to tell you what the average German answers were. Now, let's get started with the first question. And this is about the challenges of our, you know, um, 
Stone Age brain, if you will, then the next step would be to flip the switch and then the opportunities of our Stone Age brains. Let's start with the first question. How, um, how big is the percentage of grown up people who are illiterate in the world, who can read and write? 80%, 60%, 40%. Simple texts, writing and reading simple texts. And you know, grown ups or adults and all people above, are all people above the age of 15. Now just uh, think about what you think is the right answer. Make a note of that and let's move on to the next question. The number of the people dying because of natural disasters, uh, did these numbers since 1917 go down or up? Uh, have they A, doubled, more than doubled? Are they B, more or less the same? Or uh, did they go down by half? So this is, of course, the percentage because the overall uh, world's population also grew. Now, the last question here is, um, how big is the percentage of one-year-old children in the world that have a measles vaccination? 20%, 50%, 80%. Just please make a note of what you think is the correct answer. And this is now the extra question uh, that you can also answer, and that is whether you believe that you've got all the um, answers right. And in the analog events, we mostly have two or three gentlemen who raise their hand who think that they've got all the answers right. Now, the right answer to the first question is 80%. And in Germany, when we carried out this test in two, uh, 2014 with a thousand, uh, more than 1,000 uh, participants in, in cooperation with the magazine Der Spiegel, only 28% of the participants actually gave the right answer. So you don't need to have to be an expert in higher mathematics. If you were just to flip a coin, the result would be one-third, one-third, one-third. So this is even less than the chance result would be. And the, uh, um, you know, if you look at what the uh, inventor of this test, Mr. Rosling, said, well, even primates would have had a better result, although they did not understand the question. Now, the next question was the number of people dying because of natural disaster since 1917, and, and here only 6% of people in Germany answered correctly, and most people said that uh, the number more than doubled, and the last right answer is more than 80% of children uh, above the age of one are actually vaccinated against measles, and of course it's now um, unfortunate that I can't see what you answered, but I'm pretty sure, and you know, I've been doing this test for almost five years now, and I'm pretty confident that uh, the, both the digital as well as the analog audience was rather too negative. I don't think that anyone got all the answers right, and um, unless, of course, you know the test already, but if you look at the previous answer, you know, this is the test and the work of the Gapminder Foundation by Mr. Hans Rosning, who was a Swede who unfortunately passed away in 2017 because of cancer, and he wrote the wonderful book called Factfulness. Some of you may know about this book. And he actually made it his mission to use knowledge and facts in order to enlighten the world. But he rather quickly came to the conclusion that it's not that easy to just offer facts and figures. Uh, you know, and you just mentioned the subject of the climate crisis and the climate change, and it is just not enough to enlighten people, and uh, even uh, you know, less so when it comes to getting people to take decisive action. action. So well, my question is now, why do people in general um, you know, think in, too, in terms that are too negative and have a too negative outlook of the world? Well, for that, I like using this image of uh, these uh, jigsaw puzzle pieces that are dyed in dark colors in order to offer a metaphor for what the media are presenting us with when it comes to the world. Of course, that is a very simplifying statement. I can't really differentiate that much when I say the media, then of course I'm always talking about, you know, average values, you know, and in scientific terms, it's the medium value. And uh, we've got examinations and, and uh, investigations, not just in Germany, but all over the world, that uh, of course negative individual events are being reported rather more frequently, and that this is a um, tendency that is increasing. Um, so this is a tendency that has become more marked over the past few years. And the whole thing, you know, perhaps in a very palpable way, you know, you could uh, use this as an image I think is very fitting, really. You know, of course, it's somewhat outdated. We're seeing uh, the newspaper here that is catching the drops and droplets of the news. And, uh, you know, the negative, 
News are being represented by these dark droplets here. And of course, we all no longer just read the newspaper or hear the news on television or on the radio. But in principle, if we allow it to happen, we could be on 24 hours a day. We could, uh, you know, consume media all, you know, all day round, uh, especially if you've got a smartphone in your pocket. And if we wanted to, to we could, you know, read or listen to news uh, and even do it in parallel 24-7. And uh, we get, you know, an image of everything bad that's happening in the world here. And we already talked about anxieties and fears, and we also talked about what negative impressions uh, do to us, and that is to give us a feeling of helplessness. The question is, where does our predilection for the negative come from? Is well, the journalists very special people who pay special attention to negative facts and uh, thus put it uh, above the fold on page one? But, you know, even during the introductory remarks, you already mentioned that the whole thing could also be rooted in our revolution. And that is actually a fact. You know, our brain that I call our Stone Age brain is actually optimized in a way that allows us to rather more quickly and better process negative elements than positives. You know, if we look at our ancestors generations ago, uh, then, of course, everything that might have been negative news in their lives, they had to be able to um, you know, process that quicker and more intensively rather than the positive ones, because otherwise this new piece of negative information might have been the last thing to experience. So I'm now trying to embed everything into the current context. Now, this is really the worst possible uh, result for this kind of negative optimization mechanism that we've got in our brains because it actually catapulted us into a massive state of uncertainty, fear, and anxiety. And, you know, in Proverbs and Sayings, there is always a grain of truth uh, to these sayings. And this one here says that fear is a bad advisor. And that is actually correct. There are tons of studies that actually show that this is true, you know. When we're in a state of stress, either because we are hunted by a mammoth or by a tiger, this right now in a digital form, or because of the fact that we do not know what will happen in December if we look at the current backdrop of the current situation, then this actually catapults us into a state where we feel helpless and uncertain, as I already said. And, uh, you know, to give you a crash course in how our brain is working, let me tell you this. It is nothing but a forecasting machinery. And if that doesn't really work, or if it is prone to making mistakes because the uncertainty is getting bigger and bigger, um, then it means that we get a worse outcome in the short term because it's driven and based on fear. And that's also been mentioned by Mr. Buddha. You know, this is something that is not really suitable for decision making in society and that is why we need a resilient society. And the second problem that this goes hand in hand with this stone age brain is that we need to say goodbye to this constant fear because this makes for bad decision making. And the third aspect, the last aspect that I'm looking into when it comes to this challenge before building a bridge towards the constructive part is the power of habits. Let me also use a saying, we're all marked by our habits, animals following habits, as we say in German, and up to 90% of our daily routines, unless it's a special day, are, are habits and really routines in the purest sense of the term, and we don't even think about it. And here you can see the toothbrush, uh, your after work beer or the yoga mat because if we had to think about what to do next constantly we would have no cognitive resources left to do other things for instance to attend conferences or to listen to digital talks to learn new things and to find constructive solutions to challenges and problems but it also restricts us it limits us in our way of acting and in our way of thinking because we would stop coming up with solutions whenever we are constantly told that we cannot change a thing and the world is just bad and please think of the dark jigsaw puzzle pieces. So in a nutshell, let me just broach what this challenge is all about, the challenge that 
we have for our brain is that we have a predilection for what's negative. On the other hand, and this is something very much linked to the situation we're now faced with, is that fear and uncertainty are bad advisors. And thirdly, there is the power of habits that we can't just shrug off. And to sum it up, this can lead to learned helplessness. And what I call learned helplessness is a psychological concept that was coined in the end of the 1970s. It was just a matter of coincidence in research. Things are come up with, although other things are actually the topic of research. And Martin Seligman at the time, who was a graduate student at the time, doing his PhD thesis. And what he found out at the time can be summarized in this picture. He tested two groups of dogs. One group being caught in this apparatus, the way you can see it here. So on the one hand on the floor, there were mild electrical shocks exerted on that dog. And just like human beings, dogs don't particularly like electric shocks. So they tended to jump across that fence in order to find out whether they could actually get away from those shocks on the other side. And this was actually the case. They learned something, and they would stay on the other side, waiting for the experiment to be over. The second group of dogs, though, was put in a similar apparatus, suffered electrical shocks on the one side, but also on the other side, which meant that the dogs in this experiment jumped back and forth a couple of times and realized that they couldn't get away from this situation, so they just sat down waiting for them to be taken out of the box once again. And what is so interesting about it, what happened then, when taking the dogs from group two and putting them into the first case about his in an environment where they, they could get away from electric shocks, they would just stop jumping. They would just stay in their corner whining and, weeping for, and waiting for the experiment to be over. And they have thus learned to be powerless and building bridges towards digital ways of processing information, how we behave and how we react to things is that we also are, can be stuck in this learned helplessness. And this was something confirmed a couple of decades later, not with help of electric shocks, but with uh, similar experiments for students that had to do exercises. And it was demonstrated that when we are presented exercises that we cannot solve, followed by exercises we can actually solve, that we are so frustrated that we don't even start again learning about this powerlessness. And this takes me to the segue of flipping the switch and taking the opportunities. And let me just, in a nutshell, present four years of research work of my PhD period that I spent in London. And I will try and do this in just a couple of sentences and just a couple of pictures and words. First thing to bear in mind is that on the one hand, we continuously make new experience learning. So as soon as our brain changes, as soon as we perceive something, our brain changes and we learn something. So for all of you who attend that conference, you might not have come across the term learned helplessness. This is something you've newly learned or you're the first time connected on Zoom, you have learned something as well. The second thing that I focused on, on the other hand, is the current brain activity. So if we were all put in an MRT, and if we were actually examined, and the doctors would try and find out what's actually going on in our brains, maybe some of us might feel a little bit dizzy, others are wide awake, and others might have had three cups of coffee, and all of this influences our way of processing and perceiving information. And what I was able to show and demonstrate it is that there is interaction between those two aspects. So on the one hand, there is new experience, learning. Everything we do in life has an influence on our current brain activity, even if the things we've newly learned are over and done with, which means that we continuously modify our brains. It is plastic. And it is shapeable, as it says in neurosciences, and also works the other way around. Our current brain activity, the state uh, we're in right now influences the way we perceive new things and the way we learn new things. So in a nutshell, this means that all the time, constantly, we are about to change and modify our brains. And this is a lifelong experience. And every piece of information we perceive shapes our brain. And this takes us to negative habits very rapidly. And given this understanding of learned helplessness, this might give rise to a situation where we don't even start thinking about what solutions might be at hand, and we might end up in a dead end or be in a vicious cycle of just looking for scapegoats, just 
only focusing on problems without actually seeing solutions. And let me at this point be very brief and uh, quote something which I just rarely do, but let me quote this one coming from Steve DeShazer who said, talking about problems gives rise to problems, but talking about solutions gives rise to solutions. And this is the very core of the constructive or solution-oriented way of thinking, of constructive reporting and of constructive living as a whole. Because all the time it is just about one essential question, which is, what now? What next? Where are we heading? And if we are not posing this question, then every thinking and every acting will just become absurd because we could just stop going on if we do not want to talk about the future and how we would want to go on. And this takes me to the last part of my talk, and this is the opportunity of our Stone Age brain and inverted commas and how we can make good use of it. And this takes me to the most important property we have in the 21st century, which is critical thinking, a critical mindset. What do I mean by it? It doesn't mean that we should all just sit down and study philosophy, no, but it means that we should, on the one hand, recognize what I've been trying to sketch out to you in the past 15 to 20 minutes, i.e. that our brain, on the one hand, follows certain tendencies, i.e. the negativity bias, so we're more focused on negative events and we focus more on what fits well with our view of the world and it can be incorporated into our mindset more easily than other things that don't match with it. And on the other hand, we should also take an exercise, not just questioning ourselves, but questioning the status quo, the current situation, coming up with critical and solution-oriented approaches. And in closing, let me just provide you with three ingredients for this critical thinking to make it more graphic. First of all, we have naivety. This is a term that is quite uh, negatively connotated in German. People always uh, tell us off, say, telling them, well, don't be that naive. Uh, this is something we associate with childish naiv naivety or uh, the lack of dealing with complex problems. And why did I choose a picture of a football match here? It's because naivety means that we can redefine group uh, attachments and belonging to groups, and they very much mark our, uh, and shape our lives. So we tend to identify with groups very easily when there is a match of gender, education, nationalities, but also trivial things such as wearing glasses, having long or short hair, what have you, and also football clubs, for instance. And one thing that was looked into pretty much in science is that whenever we feel that we belong to a certain group, i.e. football fans of a certain club, that we tend to help other supporters, other fans of that club more than others. And what is so intriguing by matching these two aspects is that we can also change this attitude and change this behavior when people are precisely not told, to stick to that example, well, you are just a fan of Schalke Football Club or Manchester, what have you, or that you're just a football fan, and that they would also tend to help the fans, the supporters of the um, opposing team. And this is something that we all experience now live and directly when faced with the coronavirus pandemic, because it's a global issue, and just like climate change, and we no longer... Um, we can no longer actually withdraw to identities, religions, or specific groups, but we are all affected by the matter all around the globe, and we're all linked by it. And the second element is indulgence. And a couple of months, a friend of mine sent this cartoon to me and asked me, well, maybe this could be what you mean, that we have different... Uh, points of view on our world. And this is why I like to use this cartoon, because it actually illustrates indulgence that well. It illustrates that we all have a different stance, a different point of view on the world. And I started out by telling you what I used to do before I became a professor and what I learned from my teachers, that we, i.e. that we all have different ways of uh, judging the world and that we perceive colors differently or this rhinoceros differently. And the only chance we have to come to terms with it is by talking about it. And if this rhinoceros were to describe to us how it sees the world, then we 
would realize quite swiftly that we cannot take that same perspective. We cannot put ourselves in the shoes of that rhinoceros, but we can actually just try and copy it and have an exchange on it. And the third and most important ingredient that I depicted in red here, because it's so important, is curiosity. And curiosity, um, and that's quite fun to note, uh, it's not in English, but in German, it's something that is also associated, has a negative connotation, but here it's just something that I um, w would like to consider in a positive way. So negative things to be ruled out, and curiosity to look, is to look behind closed doors that you can see on the picture. Actually discovering new things, being solution-oriented and constructive and being indulgent towards one's own limitations, thinking about the future, talking about it, and walking the talk. And to round this off, and now I have to actually stick to the time, I would like to close with a question. What is the most important insight from a topical science, uh, powerlessness, learned helplessness, fear, these are just the buzzwords that I try to illustrate to you in an understandable fashion. And it's the essence is to be able to know what to influence and what cannot be influenced and to actually step out of that feeling of powerlessness to be able to raise the question of what will happen next, what now. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Great big thanks to you, Professor Orno, for this talk, which is highly tangible. It's really hands-on. So I think we will receive a great deal of questions. My first question, well, regardless of that, refers to the phrase you coined, fear is a bad advisor, and uncertainty is just the same. When I'm thinking about this sentence, I've got my issues with it, because you should actually take care of communicating scientific uncertainty actively. In the past, well, we used to just publish things we knew about and uh, be silent about what we didn't know. How can you reconcile these two approaches? So on the one hand, you're saying that uncertainty is a bad advisor, but on the other hand, uncertainties need to be conveyed and communicated. How does that fit together? Well, absolutely, you're fully right. I couldn't agree with you more. And this is something that is uh, very often and not working very well when it comes to climate change uh, news feeds because scientists are sometimes reluctant to communicate about things because they believe that they can only publish things as soon as they are 100% sure and confirmed and journalists often take it that they cannot write about things that they are not 100% sure about and so I always plead in favour of dealing with uncertainties in a much more transparent way, even communicating about things we don't know exactly. And for months now, I've witnessed also with a great deal of excitement that this has tended to happen more and more than in the reports about climate change in the past. What I mean by uncertainty is a bad advice and fear is a bad advice is that when uncertainty turns into fear and stress, that at that point, the situation is such, and this was also confirmed by neuroscientific studies, that some parts of the brain just get blocked. And in particular, those that help us to get access to our memory, to experiences made, to learn things. And in the frontal lobe in particular, the things that turn us into a human being, into a person that are necessary to be problem and solution oriented, to come up with solutions for the future. So definitely we need to communicate those uncertainties because otherwise we're just painting a black and white picture and then it is justified to accusers of, well, yeah, actually being too contradictory, but still not leaving people behind without any hope. So we have to deal with uncertainty and playing around with it uh, is something that we should not do and in order to, for instance, increase sales figures. So it is a thin line, but it's very important when dealing with global challenges the way we see them in the corona pandemic. Thank you. And climate change. Thank you so much. I'm just looking around this uh, almost deserted room, but still we have a few persons around and I'm asking you whether you've got questions. So I'm looking at you whenever you've got questions. Just give us a show of hands. Um, there are also questions online.
So the media are in a constant competition when it comes to the attention of their readers or their consumers. In this uh, so-called struggle, more and more media are increasing the uh, over-dramatizing risks, as you just outlined here, but what are the possibilities in order to stop this kind of development? So what is it that we can do in order to influence the media? Well, the brief answer, the very brief answer would be, you know, I mean, I'm also going to offer you a you know, medium kind of answer, and uh, the long answer is uh, stuff for many, many books, and that's also why we set up our online uh, at, at, um, consultancy. And I'm also trying to critically deal with this as a media researcher and, you know, to promote constructive journalism in general. But, uh, you know, this is now how I try to give you a brief answer that I hope will enlighten you. At the end of the day, it's always about the question of who's uh, funding information. With a view to this event and the larger overarching question is really what kind of information, what kind of information is necessary for democracies that would take decisions based on questions that are geared towards the future and that would also then be able to put into practice uh, future-oriented activism. And in English, there is uh, this nice expression of the elephant in the room because the funding question is never answered by media creators, you know, be it a public broadcasters or privately funded broadcasters or media uh, enterprises. And, but this is actually what uh, this question is all about, you know, the war of attention. So there are real books, uh, you know, who just look into this phenomenon. We all know what it means when, you know, we are slightly, just, you know, distracted and you might have looked at your smartphone five times during this event already. But that is how people are making money, you know, clickbait that is very alarmist, uh, you know, um, headlines, for example, try to tease you on to things that are not even mentioned in the articles themselves. And that is a perversion of how people deal with our attention. It's become the most important resource of the 21st century. And this is where we have to really uh, start saying that stop enough is enough because it's not just the journalists who feel under pressure, but also the media companies themselves, publicly funded and privately funded. And with that, of course, also the society. We're all part of this kind of, uh, you know, negative cycle. I keep asking my students whether we're all junkies and they tell me how they're using their smartphones and we're being pushed to using them in this way and that is a major challenge if not really a risk that all media creators should ask themselves about and it also needs to be a political question because we need to know where people invest what so as to make sure that we can get independent well researched and future oriented information that's necessary for a democracy wonderful thank you very much professor honor thank you very much for your explanations and for answering these questions. Uh, thanks very much also for participating online. I think everything's worked out perfect.